All right, it is 12 o'clock. So why don't we go ahead and get started with medical grand rounds. Uh, before we get into today's speakers, uh, Saturday, March 30th, this coming Saturday is National Doctors Day. Um, as a thank you, lunch today is provided by the UC Health leadership uh, in honor of all of our physicians. And I would like to introduce now the president and the chief executive officer of the University of Colorado Hospital, Tom Grenot, to say a few words of thanks to our physicians. Sorry, I was trying to time you perfectly for that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. First uh, and foremost, happy Doctors Week. Doctors Day is officially Saturday, March 30th, and wanted to say as a small token of appreciation for all that you do in caring for our patients. We can't do this without you. Uh, we certainly have to do this together. And this is a small, small, small token of appreciation of the multiple lunches that are uh, distributed in the back. So please help yourself and enjoy that. Uh, we are on a large journey here and a long journey as an academic medical center to be the best and the top decile uh, as an academic medical center. Looking forward to that journey together. A lot of changes that are happening. Uh, we'll have a new dean likely announced here in the next month or so. A lot of new leaders to campus and look forward to continuing the partnership to achieve excellence in all of our clinical research and educational missions, which are so important to what we do here as an academic medical center. So I wanted to stop by, say thank you, and hope you enjoy a good meal here and enjoy the rest of your grand rounds. Thanks for the time, Jeff. Appreciate it. Tom, thank you. Thanks for all that you do to support us. I really appreciate it. All right, so uh, before I introduce today's speakers, just a little bit of a teaser. On April 3rd, we're going to have this year's NEF lecturer, someone that a lot of you uh, know, Dr. Rob Wynn, will be coming uh, back. He was faculty here. He was a fellow uh, from VCU speaking about disparities in lung cancer. And then on April 10th, we're going to have the second of our three chief medical resident grand rounds, uh, which we preceded by today's talk, the first of the three. Uh, MOCCO. Uh, uh, COE credit for all of our talks this year. Uh, and now I want to go ahead and welcome our two speakers today, Dr. Kate Jankowski and Dr. Apoorba Ram. Uh, Dr. Jankowski is our 2023-2024 Chief Medical Resident for Quality and Safety at the Rocky Mountain VA. And Dr. Ram is our Primary Care Chief Medical Resident who has worked out of Denver Health for this entire year. Uh, a little bit about our two speakers. Kate was an undergrad at the University of Colorado where she graduated with a degree in Chemical and Biological Engineering. She was a medical student also here at CU, where she was in the urban underserved track. She was an intern and resident, of course, with us here in the hospital's training track and the health equities pathway. Uh, she is uh, a multi-awarded uh, student initially and now a uh, young physician. She was a Golden Apple Award winner as a bilingual math and science teacher in the Denver Public Schools. She was a Waring Award winner as a medical student here. And then in 2023, she was inducted into the Gold Humanism Honor Society here at the University of Colorado. Uh, a word about Apoorva. Uh, Apoorva was an undergrad at Washington University where she graduated magna cum laude with a degree in anthropology. Uh, she was a medical student at Northwestern University and then of course did her internship and residency here in the primary care track and the medical educators pathway. She was a Seder scholar uh, at Northwestern. She was also inducted into the Gold Humanism Society in 2019. And in 2022, she was named a LEAP Scholar, uh, which is a program, the Leadership and Health Equity Policy Program through the National SGIM. Both of today's speakers are our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion co-chiefs. And while their medical practices are very different, one in primary care at Denver Health, the other as a hospital medicine practitioner, primarily at the VA, they really come together in their work on advocacy and their belief that they can and will make change in the world and they are truly two excellent educators. Um, they also align on being two of the finer doctors that we have in this entire residency program. And I say that without a degree of hyperbole. Um, they really show us the best of what we can be as physicians, the best of what we can be as leaders. And so it's truly an honor to welcome doctors of Ram and Kate Jankowski to give medical grand rounds. Thank you so much um, for that wonderful introduction and thank you all for coming today. Um, so I'm Apoorva, and I'm Kate, and our topic today is gonna be about how we define and assign labels in medicine. So to bring this kind of to the fore and kind of explain why we're giving this talk, we wanted to use the example of hysteria. You may have heard about the, the disease label hysteria in the past. 
And in ancient Egypt, it was actually used to describe someone having generalized shaking of their entire body, which we relabeled over time to be epilepsy. Um, over the centuries that followed, the diagnosis of hysteria was inadequately applied to multiple different definitions of disease, including things like cancer, depression, and anxiety, essentially preventing women from accessing the care that they needed, even after these other medical conditions had been discovered. And so today, we don't use hysteria in our medical lexicon anymore for this exact reason. We've essentially been able to figure out a better definition of disease, and we label diseases that have better impacts and outcomes for women. So one of the reasons that we are putting up this slide and sharing some of our identities is illustrated by that example. A lot of what we're touching on here is, is rooted in the social sciences and a common practice in the social sciences is to center your own identities and how you're coming to the content that you're presenting. And so I've listed some of those up here. We do not have any other financial disclosures. So I know this figure is a little bit small and I'm gonna zoom in on a couple of sections soon, but I wanted to also talk first about what is a disease? And so this study was done in Finland, looking at the perspectives of lay people, doctors, nurses, and members of parliament. They were essentially asked, this state of being is a disease. Do you agree or disagree? The darker green color indicates a stronger degree of agreement, and the dark red color indicates disagreement. So let's look at a specific example of breast cancer. As you can see, uh, lay people, oops, Lay people are at the top here, doctors, nurses, and members of parliament. And you can see that pretty much every different group agrees that breast cancer is a disease. All of these bars are dark green. But if we look at the example of infertility instead, you can see here that there is general congruence between the different groups, but that about 50-50 on whether or not infertility is a disease. And we're gonna dive into this example a little bit more and into the nuances of why that is in future slides. If we now look at uh, what they call alcoholic liver cirrhosis, then you can see that doctors on the whole feel that this is a disease with a couple exceptions. And that is pretty different from what lay people and members of parliament think. And so to summarize kind of what this study tells us is that disease essentially has no universally accepted criteria. And when we were searching for a definition of uh, what disease really is fundamentally, there were so many options to choose from. And I think they summed it up really well when they said that disease can be as difficult to define as beauty, truth, or love. And so what that leaves us with is a great deal of power in how we define disease for not only generally accepted definitions for our medical community, but also for the specific person sitting in front of us in the exam room. So our talk today is gonna to be divided up into three different parts. In part one, we're gonna talk about how we label disease and how that impacts our patients. And then we're gonna talk about how the definitions of disease that we can choose from are influenced by many factors outside of just the patient provider relationship. In part two, we're gonna talk about how inappropriate definitions or labels in the past and even today have led to impacts on health disparities for some of our most vulnerable populations. And we're gonna talk about efforts in the medical system and on the individual level to redefine disease and use more patient-centered labels. In part three, we're gonna talk about how the structural determinants of health are integrated into this model and actually change the way our disease label affects our patients, as well as what we can do about those. So getting started with part one, we're gonna start here, how we label disease is impactful. And thankfully, some really smart people looked into this question for me. So there was a really wonderful systematic review that essentially looked at patients' perspectives when they were assigned a disease label. So when they were given a diagnostic label by a physician or a provider. And the, these conditions included a very, very wide range of conditions, including psychiatric conditions, things we might consider strictly biomedical and things that we might consider stigmatized. And they essentially lumped these different impacts on patients into a couple of large different buckets, which we've summarized for you here today. The first one is treatment. And we can all relate to this. This is the reason we became doctors and is why most of the time why we're labeling disease. We hope that the label of disease, for example, type two diabetes is gonna confer for the patient in front of us appropriate treatment that not only prolongs their life, but leads to a better life. And so patients felt that too. They felt that the use of a label allowed them to access appropriate treatment. But on the flip side, we can take an example of 
let's say someone was just diagnosed with heart failure through reduced ejection fraction. We all know guideline directed medical therapy is going to prolong that person's life. We also know that those medications can sometimes have significant side effects for patients and patients felt that as well. They said that the disease label did allow them to access treatment, but it also led to some side effects that they felt were unhelpful. If we move to our next big bucket, which is behavior, patients felt that there were beneficial behavior modifications that they made to their life as a result of being assigned a disease label. So for example, if we diagnose someone with type two diabetes and we assign that label of disease to them, they might change their um, diet or exercise behaviors in a way that they feel is beneficial to them. But at the same time, for other diseases and disease labels, patients felt that sometimes they had a loss of freedom in what they could do in their life, or that they even used substances to cope when that disease label felt particularly severe. And so we're gonna move to the next bucket, which is financial support. And you're starting to see a pattern here, right? There's essentially benefits and kind of drawbacks of the way we assign labels. And sometimes those are not mutually exclusive, right? We can assign a disease label that confers some kind of benefit to our patient that at the same time also confers something that they wish they didn't have. And so when we come to financial support, you can see that getting insurance and public benefits is a very clear benefit of labeling a disease for a patient. But in a subset of uh, patients that they looked at in this study, for example, pa patients with borderline personality disorder, they felt that having that disease label in their chart actually prevented other providers from looking into um, other conditions and essentially pre prevented them from accessing ongoing treat treatment or testing. And we can kind of keep going down our list of buckets to prognosis. So an example of um, prognosis being really beneficial is that when we label disease, we can help that patient make choices about how they want to live their future life. A big example of this in the article was family planning. So when someone was diagnosed with a severe chronic illness, they might take a completely different approach to family planning than they would have otherwise. But at the same time, other patients felt like this just made their entire future life very uncertain. In the realm of social support, um, really interestingly and um, kind of unsurprisingly, I should say really, is that the level of social support provided by um, healthcare providers dram dramatically increased when we labeled a disease for that patient. Um, emotional support of, in and of itself was noted to either increase or decrease kind of depending on what that label was. And then if we take, for example, um, the diagnosis of HIV, there might even be a fear of disclosing that label if they're living in a situation where that disease label is stigmatized. And so that might actually result in a decrease in social support due to stigma. And then finally, what is the psychologic impact of having a label assigned to you? Um, again, there was this potential for both positive and negative impacts and stigma, which we've already talked about, but they did note that there was also a component of adaptation to the label over time. So what does all of this together kind of tell us about how we should use our power in assigning labels? When you assign a label of a disease for a patient, you have the ability to like spark or trigger essentially both negative and positive consequences for that person, potentially even at the same time. And so our recommendation, Kate and I, we're certainly no experts in you know, patient communication or anything like that, is to use patient-centered or person-centered language to assess this impact. And we came up with a couple of examples that we like, and we recognize that a lot of these might be more applicable to some than others and have to fit with how you operate as a physician and also with the patient in front of you. But one of the ones we recommend that I really wanna point attention to is I usually recommend recommend XYZ for this disease label? What do you think about those recommendations? And the reason I like that one is that it can kind of get to some of these different recommendations that we might make that could be impacted or um, thought of differently by your patients. And then the other one that I like as well, because it's so open-ended, is how does it feel when we say that you have blank disease? Because that really just leaves the door open for a patient to address any one of these six impacts. I'm gonna pass over to Kate. All right, so for the next section of part one, we're gonna talk a little bit about the definition of disease itself. We're gonna talk about four 
uh, forces that we believe influence our medically accepted definitions of disease outside of the patient provider relationship. So we'll take the impacts away for just a moment and break it down into these four buckets. For each of these uh, influences on our definition of disease, I'm going to give you two examples. The first will be a more straightforward forward example of this influence. And the second will be a more layered or complex example of the same influence. So the first bucket that we're proposing is something we're calling education. Education is just how physicians share information with each other. That happens in UME, GME, CME, thank you for coming, and clinical practice guidelines. So a simple example of this is using up to date for uh, the best evaluation and definition of a disease you haven't seen in a while, making sure that you have accurate information. A more complex example or a layer behind education um, that we could think of was that of financial conflict of interest. So we know that authors publish their financial conflicts of interest in clinical practice guidelines, a 2016 study showed that 45% of authors of clinical practice guidelines do have financial conflicts of interest. And interestingly, another study showed that 75% of authors of clinical practice guidelines had financial conflicts of interest for those guidelines that were broadened, that broadened our accepted definition of disease. For example, lowering the threshold for hypertension. Um, we also trust our societies and associations to publish those clinical practice guidelines and make them accessible to you and I while we're treating our patients. Um, however, the associations themselves sometimes have financial conflicts of interest. The example of the American Heart Association had a uh, $912 million budget in 2016, and 20% of that did come from industry. Now, of course, I would be lost without up-to-date and these clinical practice guidelines. Um, but the question that we'll be asking ourselves moving forward is, has this definition of disease been influenced by other factors, things like um, financial conflicts of interest? And could that change how I see that definition? We'll move to the next bucket, which we're calling research. Many of you know better than I how to define research, but I think of it as the way that we learn more about disease and the clinical pathologic associations and potential treatment targets that we can uh, have. So the simplest um, and most recent in my mind uh, definition that I can think of here for uh, uh, research influencing our definition of disease was defining COVID-19 as a disease, which happened rapidly um, in that 2020, 2021 era where we were updating our clinical script based on new variants, new data, and a wide variety of both clinical and bench research. A more complicated example of um, the way that we define disease through research um, is that of Alzheimer's disease. So uh, some really excellent researchers identified that amyloid plaques are uh, aggregated in the memory centers of the brain in folks with Alzheimer's disease. So they questioned, could amyloid plaques be the cause of this memory loss? And they focused in on a clinical drug target and produced um, the first of these monoclonal antibodies called aducanumab. And aducanumab was remarkable in its ability to decrease amyloid plaque in the brain. So here is a, a patient before the clinical trial at their highest doses. One year later, the amyloid plaques on this PET scan are almost completely gone. However, this is what we call a surrogate outcome. We're hoping that our definition of disease is correct in that uh, amyloid plaques cause our symptoms, and therefore our symptoms will get better when we treat the amyloid plaques. But for aducanumab specifically, this wasn't the case. Um, it didn't affect patient outcomes um, at all in terms of dementia development or in terms of uh, memory loss. So uh, 
In fact, aducanumab is being taken off of the market this year. So a question that we'll be asking ourselves moving forward um, is, did this research center patient outcomes in defining disease? The next bucket that we'll take a closer look at is policy. So policy broadly is how we regulate disease in its evaluation and its treatment. This can happen at the hospital level, the state level, the federal level. A simple example of using policy to define disease is after the genome was sequenced, insurance companies pretty much universally uh, approved prophylactic mastectomies for folks with mutations like BRCA1 and BRCA2, essentially broadening the definition of disease to include that genetic risk factor. A more complex example that we'll look at is something like infertility. So the definition of infertility and who qualifies to have infertility varies by the state you are located in. Identities that you hold can permit or block your access to treatment. Thus, the definition of disease is different by state. So in our practice moving forward, we hope that um, we will be asking ourselves, um, are the policies that my patient's definition of disease subject to equitable? The final bucket that I'll um, ask you to follow me on in how we define disease is that of patient goals. So a simple example of patient goals influencing our medically accepted definition of disease is that of the overlap between autism spectrum disorder and ADHD. In the previous publications of the DSM, those two conditions could not overlap. And Parents of children with autism spectrum disorder argued that their children did have both conditions and that those conditions would allow them access to different services and different treatment. So in the most recent uh, edition of the DSM, overlap is now allowed and you can be diagnosed with both conditions simultaneously. A more layered example is that of erectile dysfunction. So by... Uh, Viagra was first marketed by Pfizer, um, and it was marketed to patients who had erectile dysfunction due to uh, prostate cancer surgery. This is Bob Dole, former presidential candidate, and he was a part of this campaign that helped destigmatize erectile dysfunction. And with that destigmatization came patients coming to their doctors wanting this treatment for not just surgical erectile dysfunction, but organic and non-organic causes of erectile dysfunction. Leading into today, uh, sildenafil or Viagra is marketed to a wide variety of, of patients as a lifestyle modifier, essentially broadening that definition of disease. So the question for this category that we'll be asking ourselves is, is this definition of disease patient-centered and um, is it possible that it could represent over-medicalization? So in, part, um, in this section of part one, I've given you a simple and a complex example for each of these four buckets that influence our medically accepted definitions of domain, um, of disease. Now, you may have noticed that, hey, autism spectrum disorder gets people access to treatment, maybe that's more policy. All of these things can also affect each other. So we're gonna add this arrow to our diagram moving forward, recognizing that there are complicated relationships even between these forces um, and they don't always independently act. So me, everyone else is invited, take a deep breath before we go to part two. So, Part two is how inappropriately defining and labeling disease has led to health disparities throughout history and the act of redefining and relabeling disease in patient-centered ways can improve patient outcomes and right the wrongs of some of those inequities. So in part two, um, we'll have a few cases where we look at three different uh, pieces to each inequity. The first is the defining error, the disease that we mislabeled. 
The second is the impact that it had on these vulnerable populations. And the third is suggestions for solutions and future directions. So in the example of hysteria, the defining error would have been mislabeling hysteria. The impact was women both not getting treatment for the conditions they actually had and uh, perpetuating inequities uh, in gender differences in disease uh, for decades. And the solutions in future directions have been taken on by researchers and physicians to appropriately redefine and relabel the diseases that these women actually have. Applying this to our uh, schema here, we'll have the defining error mostly um, taking place up here in our definition of disease, the impacts being both for patients and populations, and then um, separately our solutions and future directions. So the three patient populations that we'll um, take a closer look at are LGBT populations, BIPOC, which is Black, Indigenous, people of color populations, and patients with obesity. First, for LGBT populations. The defining error that we'll take a closer look at together today is the definition of homosexuality as a disease. In the 1950s, the first edition of the DSM was published and made homosexuality a mental health condition or a disease for the first time. Now this medicalization of this condition led to both legal and medical policy changes that have perpetuated stigma and that we still see lasting legislative uh, inequities for reverberating today. It was the patients themselves in this case that helped us redefine homosexuality and eventually take it out of the DSM. Um, ego dystonic homo homosexuality was the last iteration that you could see in the DSM in 1987 that was removed. However, ICD-10 codes that you can still use today were published in 1990, and there is one for ego dystonic, dystonic sexual or orientation and homosexuality. So what was the impact of labeling homosexuality as a disease for patients and the LGBT population um, more broadly? Initially, it was things like harmful treatments such as conversion therapy. And later it was things like inadequate public health research into these populations to advise things like safer sex practices in uh, LGBT populations during the AIDS epidemic. And uh, ultimately still today, there are ongoing mental health disparities between LGBT populations and their non-LGBT counterparts. So what are some solutions in future directions that we can look to to um, right some of these wrongs? The first is we recommend using patient-centered labels, particularly when that label improves access to care. So, I invite you to join me in some audience participation, very high tech thumbs up or thumbs down for if you agree. Would labeling a trans masculine non-binary person who is seeking top surgery or bilateral mastectomy um, with the ICD-10 code gender dysphoria be helpful or not helpful? Okay. So I believe that in this person seeking care, the ICD-10 code, the diagnosis of gender dysphoria, meaning displeasure into the expressed gender expression of a person, would help them access the referrals and the surgery that they are seeking. And it would be appropriate to label this as a disease, even though it is related to their identity. All right, how about an asexual man without distress related to his sexual identity? Can we label him with hypoactive sexual desire disorder? No. I agree. In this case, he's not seeking any treatment. He has comfort with his identity. And labeling that identity, identity does have the chance of causing harm due to things like stigma without the added benefit of gaining access to treatment. All right. How about... Our last case for this section, a lesbian woman wishing to have biologic child with her partner. Does the diagnosis of female infertility unspecified help this person? 
I, I see some like confident thumbs, squinty faces, some not that confident thumbs. This is a little bit unclear because this is, again, comes back to that issue of policy. So policy impacts what benefit we can give our, um, our patients with infertility. So um, looking at just biologically female people, as opposed to biologically male people, these may be gay, lesbian women, these may be single mothers by choice, these may be gay men, single fathers by choice. If they have no insurance coverage to have um, IVF and a biological child for women who have a uterus and would not need a surrogate, that can cost between $15,000 and $100,000. For men who do not have a uterus and would need a surrogate, that can cost between $120,000 and $200,000. So in 31 states, there's no insurance coverage that's mandated at all. It's at the discretion of your employer. In Colorado, we do have mandated fertility preservation and IVF. However, for women, this means that you have to have undergone six IUI, intrauterine insemination treatments, which runs between $15,000 and $35,000 before insurance coverage can possibly kick in. For men without uh, who would need a surrogate, none of their cost is covered. For uh, In Minnesota, there's a new bill that's posing not only private insurance coverage, but public insurance coverage, which means folks with Medicaid could access IVF. Um, they also attempted to be more equitable by saying that any fertility coverage, including IVF, could, would be covered at the same uh, price for deductibles and copays for any uh, obstetric appointment. So this is equitable coverage for folks in a heterosexual relationship or uh, lesbian women and single mothers by choice. They don't address gay men, so it's impossible to know if there would be any coverage at all for them. The VA, surprisingly, is the most progressive slide that I will have up here. Just two weeks ago, they announced that they would broaden their IVF coverage to not just service-connected conditions, but to single mothers by choice, lesbian women, and parents who are not married who need uh, fertility coverage. Unfortunately, gay men, again, not at all covered in this policy. So what can you do to use your power as an individual provider for LGBT populations, knowing that this inappropriate definition of disease and labeling of disease has hurt this population throughout time? The first is we recommend that you use patient-centered labels to reduce stigma and increase access to care. And the second is that you get to know the potentially inequitable policies as they affect your patients, your state, and your hospital system. Our next example that we're gonna dive into is gonna be our Black, Indigenous, People of Color populations. And we're gonna follow, again, that same format. So looking at the defining error, the impact on this population, and some solutions. I see a lot of pulmonary critical care doctors here in the audience, and you might be familiar with some of the PFT calculation changes, but we're gonna start with kind of what happened in the 1800s to 1970s. A whole bunch of research was done to figure out how can we correlate the findings that we have on a pulmonary function test and use a calculation to give our physicians who are in the clinic a clear number of what's abnormal or uh, normal for any given person. Those studies included black and white populations and they accidentally used race as a proxy for several other socio-environmental factors. So in one of the studies that they looked at, Black patients who were in the study were much more likely to be working in an occupation that also put their lungs at risk for disease. We now know that race is superficial and is not based in biological differences, but at the time this was not known. And so these um, differences in lung function were baked into the way that pulmonary function testing was reported to physicians, essentially changing the way that we defined disease and having different definitions of what was abnormal and normal between black and white people. This, of course, trickled down into the way that we labeled disease for the patients by using the pulmonary function tests that were put in front of us in the clinic. 
And so what impact did this differential labeling have on our patients? We now have research that this resulted in underdiagnosis of black patients for multiple different lung conditions. And that when pulmonary function testing was used to determine eligibility for things like lung transplant or surgical resection, these disparities ended up becoming compounded. And so the original research that was conducted started to be questioned mainly by the European Respiratory Society and the American Thoracic Society, who as they're using their power in creating clinical practice guidelines, re-evaluated whether that original research should be used in our pulmonary function test calculations. And they said in 2022 that they unequivocally discouraged the use of race and recommended a switch to a Z-score. I think the pulmonologists in the room probably know that there are some other reasons as well that they switched to the Z-score, but this was one of them. And so what did this do? This essentially said, we're not going to use this data. We are going to instead use some of our new data to create the Z-score. And that is gonna change our definition of disease. We hope that by changing that generally accepted definition of disease through our power, making these guidelines, that all of the physicians and providers that are using pulmonary function tests will now label disease more equitably. And we hope that that is also gonna have trickle down impacts on our patients. And so this is just one example, but a lot of these sort of race-based guidelines have been used. And so we recommend for you at your individual provider level, especially here at an academic institution where so many of us are involved in the creation of education tools for the rest of the community, is to update clinical tools, guidelines, and trainee education, and really ensure that race is not being used um, as a proxy for socio-environmental factors. Um, when you're in the clinic or teaching, uh, teaching trainees at the bedside, we also recommend that you sort of question and combat the use of race-based disease stereotyping in the clinical calculators that you use or in the tools that you have at bedside. And then finally, in the realm of research, recommending that you sort of conduct and rely on research in which race is a social and not biologic construct. All right, our final population that we'll take a closer look at is um, folks with overweight and obesity. So obesity as defined by the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists is a biologic, preventable, and treatable disease. That means a person has too much body fat. So where's the error? The error dates back to the 1830s when the BMI was first proposed and calculated by a Belgian statistician. He took a look at 7,500 healthy men from mostly European, although 12 uh, separate populations of men across the world. His goal in doing this was to define the average man, to plot something on a bell curve and be able to say, here are some small, medium, and large people. And the uh, Equation that he eventually settled on was someone's weight divided by their height squared, and lo and behold, it looked like a bell curve. So the error was in applying this ratio of height and weight to mean a person has too much body fat. The NIH initially in the 1980s um, started taking this from life insurance companies that predict predicted mortality and applying it to their research in obesity and stratif uh, stratifying, oh my goodness, stratifying. stratifying folks who um, uh, fit into different BMI categories. So unfortunately, um, this is not accurate about someone's adiposity and it lacks external validity being based in the 1830s, um, a male only study. Now today, the BMI is automatically calculated in most of our electronic medical rec records and sometimes automatically populated into our notes, um, pushing us to use that height and weight ratio to say something about adiposity. And the CDA, CDC warns us against this. They say that the BMI is a screening tool. It does not diagnose body fatness or health. And it is our job to use a positive screen on BMI to then assess if someone does have too much body fat that is putting them at risk or has the disease of obesity. So what is the impact of using BMI to label obesity for folks or to define obesity as uh, more generally. 
The first is psychologic, and it's something we're all well aware of. Um, weight stigma is pervasive in our field, and patients feel that. It affects the way that they interact with our healthcare system. Some folks avoid healthcare um, due to stigma and obesity. Some folks with obesity even seek more healthcare, seeking that validation that they're worried they have some complications that they may not have. In a very interesting study that looked at just the application of a label to folks, they were able to differentiate people into two groups. They stratified, oh my gosh, they stratified into um, groups by BMI number, and they compared them between these two groups. They said, um, do you identify with the label overweight or obese? Or do you not identify with the label overweight or obese, even though you both have a BMI of 31? And the folks who identified with the label obese had stress, more stress-induced or disordered eating. They gained more weight over time compared to their counterparts who did not identify with that label. They had worse psychologic outcomes, including anxiety and depression. And they had worse weight-related outcomes, including cardiovascular disease and diabetes. In a separate study, the act of advising someone to lose weight can sometimes lead to something called weight cycling, where folks are able to lose a little bit of weight, and then they gain back that weight plus a little more in a cyclic fashion. And folks who have weight cycling have increased mortality compared to folks who just stay the same weight or gain that same amount of weight without cycling. We also run the risk um, in our folks with overweight and obesity of missing non-obesity related causes of their symptoms. For example, shortness of breath could be misdiagnosed as deconditioning as opposed to something more serious like COPD or PE. So what are some solutions and future directions for our patients with overweight and obesity? Guidelines agree that we should be asking permission to discuss weight with our patients because of that risk of harm and stigma that comes with a label like obesity and overweight. Once you have asked for permission, if uh, the patient has granted that for you, then we recommend using patient-centered labels, particularly when the label improves access to care. So I think this one will be a little harder, but we're gonna go through uh, three more examples and I'd love to see your thumbs. Do you think this person would benefit from a label or a diagnosis in this case? So we have a middle-aged man with metabolic syndrome and an A1C of eight and a BMI of 41. Does the ICD-10 code obesity due to excess calories with a modifier of BMI of 31 help this person? Should we use this label? Cool. Sideways thumbs, up thumbs, down thumbs. I'm thinking for this person, although I'm not an endocrinologist, that maybe I can get this person increased access to care to better treat their metabolic syndrome with this diagnosis. And if this diagnosis is something that improves their access to care, it's appropriate, and you've discussed it with the patient, it's appropriate to use this label. How about a woman admitted for gastric cancer and poor PO intake with a BMI of 31? Does the label obesity due to excess calories and a BMI of 31 help this person? No. So I agree. In this case, this person is coming in because they cannot eat. Telling them they have obesity because they've eaten too much does not help them. And it does not get them better access to care. So labeling them with obesity in this case, knowing that their risk for future metabolic syndrome or complications of obesity is already lower because of their uh, poor prognosis with gastric cancer is not helpful. All right, a healthy man in clinic, a BMI of 31. What do you think? Okay, fewer votes than ever. It's hard to know because what we don't know is first of all, is this Arnold Schwarzenegger who has a BMI of 31 and the BMI does not relate to adiposity, and what is the risk of adiposity anyway? So some 
Uh, recent guidelines and position statements were published um, by the American Academy of Clinical Endocrinologists and the American College of Endocrinology. And they recommended a change from obesity to the term adiposity-based chronic disease. And the reason that they wanna do this is they wanna say this isn't just about BMI and we recommend that we take a step away from uniformly labeling folks with obesity based on weight, but we emphasize a complication-centric approach to both therapeutic decisions and desire, desired outcomes. So this means um, lifestyle medicine throughout their course and protocols to manage adiposity-based um, research, uh, adiposity-based complications throughout research and in the clinic. They also recommend um, something that Apoorva is about to talk a little bit more about. When you label someone with a disease, you must contextualize the patient and look for more than just the diagnosis itself. Are there obesogenic risk factors that this person is subject to? For example, if you have food insecurity and only have access to highly processed food without uh, complex nutrients, your chance of having obesity is higher. If you have adverse childhood events, your chance of having obesity is higher. If you have eating disorders, your chance of having obesity is higher. So finding the uh, obesogenic risk factors in this patient and treating those, not just the number on the scale. We also recommend continuing to find better ways to monitor folks throughout their care with us, more than just the BMI, more than just that number on the scale. So your power at the individual provider level in our folks with overweight and obesity are to critically appraise the BMI, both as it comes to us in the literature and the patient in front of us, and to question and combat the labels um, that did not equal health status or adverse outcome for BMI in some patients. And if you're a researcher, I hope you use this um, ABCD uh, adiposity-based chronic disease approach in um, looking at uh, how obesity affects our patients. All right. The summary for part two is that we should be using patient-centered labels when the label improves access to care and that we need to critically appraise all of the information that comes to us as we define disease. And so in the final part of this talk, we are going to overlay how the structural determinants of health interacts with our model. And we're gonna focus on the way this interacts with our application of a disease label and what we can do about it. So let's start with the first part here. What are the structural determinants of health? Sometimes they're called the social determinants of health. This is one way to group them. And there's a lot of different societies that have different thoughts on how we should group the social determinants of health. But fundamentally, what they are, are the non-medical factors that can influence health outcomes. The World Health Organization defines them as all of the different environments in which you pass all of your time, essentially. And so how did we get to this point? Research began in the 1970s and was mostly in the realm of public health. Over time, this evolved to include information about the underlying pathways under the structural determinants of health and also interventions and how efficacious those were. In 2008 and 2010 was when the World Health Organization and the Department of Health and Human Services added these definitions to, um, or added the structural determinants of health to their goals. And um, we're going to kind of drill down on a, one example within economic stability to see how this can apply to our um, model. So we're going to look at food insecurity. A patient comes into your clinic and they have polydipsia, polyuria, and a family history of diabetes. So you're thinking, I wonder if this is diabetes. You order an A1C and you're so smart, it comes back at 10. And you're like, great, I am gonna give the label of diabetes to this patient. And your hope is that this is gonna get them some medications that are gonna improve their life and in terms of both mortality and morbidity, you suggest some specific changes to diet and exercise after eliciting what they're currently doing. And you're hoping that you're gonna get coverage for supplies to monitor their blood glucose, perhaps even some nurse visits to check in on how things are going. And you hope that their community is going to support that behavior change that you were working on. And this is all ideal. 
And if someone is having food security, perhaps they can achieve all of those things. But let's look at the exact same person who's experiencing food insecurity. Though you might have some specific changes to diet and exercise that you recommend, that person may just have inadequate access to food altogether or inadequate access to healthy food. So they can't achieve that one goal. They may also, if everyone else in their community is in a similar situation, not have any of the social support that somebody else might have. So to conceptualize this into our framework, we can sort of envision the structural determinants of health as underneath our label of disease in this kind of vague orange blob. And that is essentially to show that a same, the exact same label of disease for one person might affect uh, the impact that that label has because it's filtered through the structural determinants of health. So that begs the question, what can we do about that if we know that that's happening? So how does our labeling of the structural determinants of health impact that? The major accrediting bodies for undergraduate and graduate medical education believe that we should be labeling disease and or labeling the structural determinants of health and disease and understanding how those impact our patients. In medical school, there was a survey uh, done by the American Medical Association of 29 schools. They essentially asked, how much do you prioritize teaching about the structural determinants of health? Not one of those 29 schools rated it as extremely low. So about one third said that their priority was low. So the structural determinants of health were mentioned, but it wasn't a major focus. The other around two thirds felt that the structural determinants of health were so important that they received as much attention as a basic science course or a, uh, received attention at multiple different levels. And this can be said to be true of residency programs as well, though there's a lot more heterogeneity in the data. And so this 2015 survey, which we can hope has improved since then, um, showed that about 70% of residents who were surveyed had some training in caring for patients with health disparities. And so what happens when we do all this training? Are we labeling structural determinants of health more. When medical students and residents have a curriculum, they are more comfortable and knowledgeable in labeling the structural determinants of health. So let's do the thumbs again. Do you guys think labeling the structural determinants of health improves patient outcomes? Okay, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of thumbs up. So let's look at the answer to that with a deep dive into policy. Come with me on this journey. I promise I'll make it Relatable. So the Medicare launched a program called the Accountable Health Communities or AHC. And this aimed to improve the labeling of health related social needs and impact patients through connections with community service providers. A health related social need is essentially a structural determinant of health that applies at the individual patient level. So social structural determinants of health are a big umbrella and then health related social need is the specific need from the patient in front of you. This um, model screened people for these five health-related social needs, housing, food, interpersonal violence, issues with utility like gas and electric, and then issues with transportation. Of the uh, people who had greater than one health-related social need, by screening and then referring them to a community service partner, 36% of that group had, that health had at least one of their health-related social needs resolved. And you could say, that's amazing, and it is. That's about 30,000 patients from this model alone. But my question was, why did this work for that 36% of people and not work for 64% of people? And so the Department of Health and Human Services happened to have the exact same question. So they did a systematic review to see why do some of our interventions work so well and others don't, and which ones are the ones that work so that we can specifically use those after we screen our patients. And so this is gonna be a quick run through and I definitely recommend that you read the entire 31 page document whenever you get the chance, but the housing instability um, component, what does work in that scenario? Permanent supportive housing, housing first, which shout out again to the VA, I promise we're not sponsored by them, was first uh, discovered by the, by the VA and then has now become the gold standard for people experiencing homelessness. Low barrier care, which I summarize as meeting people where they're at, telemedicine, mobile units, um, street medicine. And then for food insecurity, they found that public benefit programs like Women, Infants, and Children and SNAP or su Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program were effective. Food pharmacies and prescription show some initial promising evidence. Um, and then home delivered meals like Meals on Wheels. For transportation, non-emergency medical transportation, which we all colloquially sometimes call Medicabs, proven to be effective. 
Um, public transport, interestingly, proven to be effective when you compare communities that have high uh, levels of public transport and low levels of public transport. And then social and economic mobility. This one's been a lot harder for people to study and a lot more recent, but they have looked at some very specific populations, mostly around psychiatric outcomes. And they found that supplemental income programs and earned income tax credits can help with specific health outcomes relating to psychiatric uh, morbidities. And then social service connections. So this brings us back to the AHC model, the Medicare model. They essentially found that referrals can work but only when they're partnered with really robust partnerships with community organizations. And those community organizations need to have the resources to fulfill what they're trying to fulfill for your patients. So we've built this framework over time and we've hopefully proven that labeling actionable social determinants of health can actually impact the way that your disease label interacts with the structural determinants of health. So, we hope that by labeling the structural determinants of health that are evidence-based and that you have the resources to address, you can help reduce the impact of the structural determinants of health on that disease label for the person in front of you. And this might seem hard on each individual provider level. And so the best level in my mind to kind of approach this is from the clinic level or the healthcare team level, right? What can your healthcare team do to know what the evidence-based solutions are for each individual health-related social need or actionable structural determinant of health, right? Okay, so to summarize, we built this over time and kind of showed that the definition of disease is influenced by many different factors outside of just you and the patient in the room and the things that you learned in medical school. The way that we label disease is hugely impactful for the person in front of us, irrespective of all of those other factors. Inappropriate definitions and labels historically have led to health disparities for some of our vulnerable populations. And there's a lot of things that we can do with our power over education, research, policy, and labeling to help counter some of those inequities. And then finally, the structural determinants of health overlay onto this and must not be forgotten when you're in the room with the patient and in the clinic. Thank you so much for listening. Hopefully we have a couple minutes for questions and we welcome all of them. Thank you both so much. We do have time for questions. I will throw it open to the audience first. Brian. Thank you very much to both of you. That was wonderful, a really nice walkthrough. And I loved all the endocrinology that you had in there. Um, one thing I was wondering about with, stru with structural determinants of health, um, one thing we don't in subspecialty clinics that I see commonly, um, you do like a review of systems and things like that. In primary care, is there that sort of equivalent for structural determinants of health that, that can sort of be done by the patient ahead of time so you can go over that with them to help? manage them through that? Yeah, that's a great question. So it really depends, I think, is the answer. And there's probably other people that I see here in the audience who might be able to chip in with some answers. But um, my understanding is that it depends on your clinic setup and the payment models that uh, reward for screening for health-related social needs. And so more and more payment models from what I've been reading are starting to include that in their reimbursement for um, care. And so I think hopefully as that continues, more and more clinics and primary care will be including that. Well, wait a second, see if there's any more questions. Uh, I'll take a minute since we've got one. Is there any, I was thinking about this as you were talking, which is, is there any role for pre-work on this, right? We know our patients for many years we know who they are well before they develop any of these diseases. And maybe some of them we can see coming and others are just statistically more probable. Did you find anything in your research in terms of preparing people? So these, like, these labels have more of a positive impact as opposed to the negative impact we know that they can also carry. I have not found any research on that. Um, I will say that, um, your question reminds me of an experience I had um, with a patient I had a very good relationship with, young guy. We were sort of joking around when I called him, knew he would be nervous. I called him to tell him his MRI had an ACL tear, and I was still in that sort of lighthearted mood, and he 
broke down in tears and could not quite like hold how significant this change was going to be for his life moving forward. Um, and so I think that like in our own interactions, like knowing that we don't, we can't anticipate the impacts that we will have perhaps should should address how we approach a conversation, knowing that you may have negative associations, I don't, with something like a knee injury. Like, how can I better support you through this conversation? And then asking those questions like um, Apoorva had brought up, like, how does this affect you and your loved ones? What, what does it feel like when we use that term? Like, what does that mean for you to know maybe the patient can teach us what the impact might be for them in that moment? I wish I had a paper for you, sorry. I think um, I haven't seen the paper in terms of framing for the definition of disease, but I have seen a paper in terms of framing for side effects of medications. And um, I'm rem not remembering exactly which medication it was, but framing that the side effects were expected and not dangerous did help people to stay on that specific medication for longer. So I do think there's power in how you frame the thing that you are sharing with the patient. This is great. And we are right at one o'clock. So I just want to say to our chiefs, thank you very much. And excellent grand rounds. Thank you.